I failed miserably my first go around using a traditional Hebrew grammar. Have you ever heard anyone say something like that? Have you ever experienced that feeling? What if the majority of approaches to teaching the biblical languages have been unhelpful all along, setting people up for failure? And what if that has led to a world where Bible translation is being done by people who do not know the biblical languages or have a very weak grasp of them? I want to spend some more time talking about this. I think we need to do that. So this is Working for the Word. I'm Andrew Case. Let's get started. For those of you who are just tuning in, this is the second part in a conversation about language learning, specifically the biblical languages. And before we get into this, once again, I want to give a disclaimer. And that's, this is not about bashing people who have taught biblical languages in the traditional grammar way of doing things. That's not the point of this. The point of all of this is to sharpen one another as scholars, language learners, and Bible translators. That's what we're supposed to do in the academic community. When we see that things could be done better, our job is not to be quiet and say, well, we do not want to disrupt the status quo or make someone feel bad. Our job is to winsomely convincingly present our point of view so that others can learn from it and make changes or give us clear reasons why we are wrong and show us the evidence and the research behind that. Now, one of the reasons I think this hasn't come up very much is because there is a division that I have perceived between the seminary world and the language acquisition world or the linguistic world. It's pretty safe to say that the same people who are very interested in becoming pastors are not precisely the same people who are interested in becoming linguists or Bible translators. I have seen this because I've lived in both of those communities. So first at the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary, I rubbed shoulders with a lot of people who were studying to go into ministry. Greek and Hebrew was just something to get there. It was a stepping stone that was required by the institution, but not necessarily something they were excited about, and it probably wasn't, in the majority of the cases, the main reason people went to seminary. They wanted to learn the other stuff, systematic theology and apologetics and church history and that sort of thing. So I sat through a lot of different language courses, Greek and Hebrew, some of the most advanced ones, and the truth is, maybe one person per class, if you were lucky, had some interest in linguistics or a background in linguistics. Then you had the professors who were usually people who had been trained at seminaries, and so they didn't really have a background in linguistics. It was never a given that they had studied it. If they had, it might be a marginal interest or something that they had studied informally. Now, fast forward to my time at the Canada Institute of Linguistics. I found myself in a community of people who were fascinated with languages, who were fascinated with the way grammar works in different parts of the world, different sounds that different languages make, different syntax, but it was the opposite in this case with the biblical languages. The majority of them had never studied the biblical languages, nor did they necessarily have an interest in going very deep into them. Now, to be fair, there were definitely more people involved in linguistics who were interested in the biblical languages than people in seminary who were interested in going into linguistics. So, there is that. 
But the problem that I saw is that people who were learning a lot about linguistics, getting their masters in linguistics and all of this kind of thing, they were going off to the mission field or to do linguistic work outside of the country. They were not setting out to change the way biblical languages were taught using what they had learned. Some of them would then go to seminary after the linguistic studies, and then they would get taught with the traditional grammar method, either Greek or Hebrew. And I heard some of them comment about how what they received, the instruction that they received, was so awkward and unnatural in light of what they had learned in their courses on second language acquisition. But the problem was that they were not called to stay home and revamp the whole biblical language training system. And if some of them eventually go back to teach at an institution, they will not go back to a seminary, most likely. They'll go back to teach linguistics to train other Bible translators. So, are you starting to see this disconnect? The science and the research behind language acquisition isn't really filtering into the seminary institutions and impacting the way that biblical languages are taught, refining it, and helping it improve. Now, I still think my seminary is one of the best seminaries in the world. It was the best time of my life there. But, you know what's strange to me? I never once was told about the study of second language acquisition, that there were actually other ways of doing it besides just opening up a really complex grammar book and just hammering in lists of vocabulary and paradigms. I was never taught that. I was never even informed that there's this whole world out there of science that is trying to find the optimal way to learn a language and understand the way God made our brains to learn language. I think it would have been really nice in my biblical language courses to have the professor tell me, look, what we're doing here is not actually the natural way that has been proven over time and through all the scientific research that people actually acquire language. What we're doing here is teaching you to analyze a language like a code, but we're not actually going to help you learn it with any kind of fluency and all that kind of thing. Now, if they had been upfront and honest about that, that would have been really great. And if they had also told me, hey, there's this other method If you don't like the way that I teach it because I learned this way and it worked for me, if you don't like the way I teach it, well, here's another option that you might want to look into, etc. The reason I say that is because if you are like me, most people who hear about learning Greek and Hebrew, they assume that when you go to learn in a course, let's say Hebrew, The whole point is so that once you finish that course, you're going to just sit down and you're going to open your Hebrew Bible and you're going to go to the Psalms and you're just going to read it like it was English and you're going to do your devotions in Hebrew. And when you go to church, you're going to take your Hebrew Bible with you and every verse that the pastor preaches from out of the Old Testament, you're just going to be able to follow along like no problem. And, and that's what they expect. When I talk to people who don't know the biblical languages, they just automatically assume that I just read Hebrew for fun and I can do these amazing studies all on my own. I just rip through the Hebrew Bible like it was nothing. And that is simply not the case. But then on the flip side, because that is the unspoken expectation of every student, and that is also what you think is expected of you to come out with when you study at seminary. Everybody assumes, well, if I'm not coming out of these courses doing this, or if I'm not able to do this after a couple years of having studied, then there's something wrong with me. I'm just not smart enough. Now, I think the other thing that drives this mentality forward, the mentality of the grammatical method, 
is that we want, in biblical studies, we want pinpoint accuracy, right? Because theology is at stake. Correct thinking and orthodoxy are so, so paramount. So the assumption is if we give them all of the grammar rules, all the rules that will promote this amazing accuracy in the exegesis of Scripture, then we'll have really faithful ministers of the gospel. It doesn't matter if they learn to be fluent in the language and speak it or they can listen to it comfortably and understand it, all of that kind of thing. No, they need to be able to decode it with pinpoint fine accuracy. In other words, it's not actually important to acquire the language or internalize the language. What's most important is to know how to pick it apart and be accurate with all of the grammatical rules. So in light of that, let's listen to Stephen Krashen again. I know some of this will be overlap from the last episode, but if we're going to do a paradigm shift in the biblical languages, it's probably a good idea to hear some things more than once. So here we go. Here's what I decided then. We have acquisition, we have learning, they do different things. Acquisition, I decided then, gives us our fluency, learning, gives us our accuracy. Isn't that nice? Two components, two contributions. Obviously, we want both. We want our students to speak easily and fluently, but we also want the grammar to be there. It turns out that's wrong. It's all wrong. What the research has been telling me since 1975, nearly every day, The action is here. Acquisition gives us fluency and accuracy. Even for the most analytic thinking, grammar-loving adult, it's nearly all acquisition. For the child, it's 100%. Let me tell you this, no one was more disappointed to discover this than me. I told you a few minutes ago, I have a PhD in grammar. Until 1975, grammar was my life. I love grammar. I can't tell you how much I love grammar. Have you ever opened a good grammar book and look at the verb conjugations? I think they're beautiful. My idea of a good time is to find a grammar of a language I don't know, see how they do the future tense. Yes. When my intellectual hero, I don't know if you've heard of this guy, Noam Chomsky. Oh yeah, okay. From 1973 to 1975, I was director of an English as a second language program in New York. And I told, it was at Queens College, I told my teachers, Here are the universals of language teaching. Explain the rules clearly. Correct errors. That's what I said. I wrote several papers saying that. They were published in the best, most prestigious journals. They're all wrong. A lot of people think that was my best work. Anyway, you're listening to a convert today, and it's the research that's changed my position. There's no way out. It's acquisition that makes things work. It's very, very hard to use this monitor. I want to tell you how hard it is. Much harder than we ever thought. We have overestimated how much people can handle grammar. There are three conditions that have to be met if you want to use grammar, and they are daunting conditions. Very, very challenging. Number one, you got to know the rule. You got to know the rule. This is really hard. Let me give you an example. Take your pen and draw a circle on your page about the size of a large coin. Please do this with me. Let's say this is with mathematics talking. This is a set. 
of all the rules of English. We English, we're going to use English as an example because English has been studied more than any other language. We know more about English than any language. This is all the rules. Let's say we go to the world's greatest syntactician. We go visit Professor Chomsky himself. And we say, Professor Chomsky, how many rules do you know of English? Now, Chomsky knows more about English than anyone alive. He knows more about English than anyone who has ever lived. That's what his team does. They look for universal principles by intensive study of languages. Uh, but if you ask him, how many rules do you know, he would say, he's very modest, we've only discovered fragments. But let's give him a lot of credit. Let's say Professor Chomsky and his colleagues know about this many rules of English. Give the, do a circle inside your circle. We call this in math a proper subset. This is the number of rules, that, the percentage of rules that Chomsky knows. Let's say now we go to what we call professional grammarians. These are people who read the works of Chomsky, study the works of the syntacticians, and they write grammar books. They don't know as many rules as Chomsky, because Chomsky's discovering new rules all the time. But these people know a lot of rules. Draw a circle representing all the rules they know. Do this yourself. Give them a lot of credit. Can you do that? Draw a circle. OK. Number four. Let's say we ask grammar teachers. The best, most dedicated grammar teachers draw a circle representing the number of rules they know. Now, they don't know as many as the grammarians or as Chomsky, but they know a lot. Let's give them credit. Next, all the rules the most dedicated grammar teachers teach. See where I'm going. They don't teach all the rules they know. Can't possibly. Next, the number of rules the most hardworking students understand. They don't understand all the rules we give them in class. Next, all the rules the best students remember. The little dot you have in the middle is the limit of the conscious grammar for our very best students. We have overestimated how much people can learn about grammar. Well, the next issue then is if acquisition is more important than learning, how do we acquire language? How does it happen? Let me begin the discussion by making an outrageous statement. In my opinion, we all acquire language the same. We all acquire language the same. This is an outrageous statement. You should be offended by this statement. Because those of us in education like to emphasize how our students are different, not how they're the same. School pushes uniformity. And every teacher you run into says, this makes life impossible, because kids are different. They have different interests, different abilities. They want different things. So we all want to, nevertheless, there are some things we all do the same. Let me give you some examples. Digestion. We all digest food the same. Put in your mouth, down your stomach. That's how, it, that's how it works in Africa, Asia, North America, South America, everywhere in the world. The visual system is the same for everyone in the world. It's always the occipital lobe in the back of the brain. It's never in the front of the brain. It's never in the side of the brain. It's never in the elbow. And language acquisition is the same. And rather than just talk about it, I'd like to show you. I'd like to take just a couple of minutes ah, and do some sample language lessons. Uh, before I do that, though, uh, I need your permission. Is that OK, some language lessons? Do you mind? It's OK? Lots of enthusiasm. <laughs> Let me tell you what just happened, in case you didn't see. The people in the back thought it was a good idea. So, sure. Way over there. Yeah, OK. Not much reaction from this table, OK? <laughs> what goes through your mind when this expert comes, says, language lesson, crosses the line of blood in the sand, comes down from the podium, and comes right up 
to where you're sitting, what goes through your mind? Oh no, he's going to call on me. I'm going to have to say something. I'll make a mistake. I'll be humiliated. Come on, you're all grown-ups. And still the idea of a language lesson in public makes you at least a little bit nervous. What does this mean? In my opinion, it means we're doing something fundamentally wrong, something fundamentally unnatural the way we teach language. It's not your fault if you felt a little anxious. I would feel the same way. I'm going to give you the lessons anyway, but I'm going to go back up there. Sorry to frighten you. Um, <laughs> I know how it is. I'm going to give you two lessons. I'll use a language that you have, some of you have heard before. Maybe some of you speak, studied it in school. I'll give you two lessons, and you can tell me which of the two you like better. Very short. Lesson number one. Wir werden jetzt anfangen, Deutsch zu lernen, und ich möchte in Voraus sagen, dass nach meiner Meinung Deutsch ist eine sehr schöne Sprache. Und ich hoffe, dass Sie alle sehr viel Erfolg mit Deutsch haben werden. What do you think? Good lesson so far? You think if I kept talking like that, you'd pick up German? How about if I repeated it? Would that help? How about if I said it louder? Thank you. That would be good. Someone said, slow down. Are there any German speakers here? Well, if they're, okay, good. You're my witnesses. That was pretty slow, okay? It wasn't the problem. I know, I'll write it on the board. I'll write it on the overhead. I'll erase every fifth word. You guess what the word is. None of those things matter. None of those things mean anything. Here's lesson number two. Das ist meine Hand. Verstehen Sie das? Hand? Ja? Sagen Sie ja. Ja, gut. Das ist mein Kopf. Kopf. Verstehen Sie Kopf? Ja? Also Kopf. 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 <lacht> ist gut, ja? Ja. Hier ist Mr. Spock. <lacht> Mr. Spock hat zwei, ein, zwei, zwei, Ohren. Verstehen Sie das? Ohren? Okay. Also, Mr. Spock. Ja, sehr gut. Augen. Verstehen Sie Augen? Ja, Augen. Wie viele Augen? Eins, zwei, drei Augen. Ist das richtig? Ja, drei Augen? Ja? Nein, wir haben nur zwei Augen. Zwei Augen, also. Mund. Verstehen Sie Mund, ja? Und hier ist eine Zigarette, ja? Nein. Zigaretten sind nicht gut. If you understood lesson number two, not every word, but more or less, I did everything necessary to teach you German. I will now share with you the most important concept I have learned about language, the best kept secret in the profession. We acquire language in one way and only one way. Here it is. When we understand it. That's it. We acquire language when we understand it. When we understand what people tell us, not how they say it, but what they say, and when we understand what we read. We call this comprehensible input. Comprehensible input has been the last resort in the language teaching profession. We tried everything else. We've tried making kids talk, grammar instruction, group therapy, the computer, we've tried everything else. The only thing that counts is comprehensible input. Let me share with you some mystical, amazing facts about language acquisition. This has been the last resort in the language acquisition. Okay, there I was. Three amazing facts. Three amazing mystical facts about language acquisition. Amazing mystical fact number one. Language acquisition is not hard work. 
In fact, it's pleasant. All you had to do was watch me make a few silly jokes on the overhead, and you acquired a little German. And he's waiting for you outside. No, that's, I'm sorry. I don't know why I do that. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> so all you had to do was watch me make these jokes, and you acquired a little bit, etc. So number one, it's not difficult. Number two, language acquisition is involuntary. Ooh. Like it or not, you all just acquired some German. There's nothing you can do about it. It's over. It's too late. Isn't that wonderful? Given comprehensible input, you must acquire. You have no choice. That's the way the brain is made. This is an astonishing fact. It comes from Chomsky's work. I think it applies to language acquisition absolutely everywhere. Now that we've heard what Krashen has to say, I want to offer another little critique of my language acquisition training. My experience at the Canada Institute of Linguistics does not represent everyone's experience at the Canada Institute of Linguistics. Neither does it represent everyone's experience with different linguistic training schools across the globe. I unfortunately was not taught what Stephen Krashen just said. Instead, in my second language acquisition course, I was offered a buffet of all sorts of different theories about language acquisition. Then each week, we were assigned to try out some different kind of method or theory in our language learning practice time, which happened to be with a Swahili speaker. Now, one week of experimentation with a particular method or theory is not enough to actually see if it works. And so what you come out away with after all of that is just more confusion than actually feeling like I've learned and mastered one way that's been proven and that has the research backing it up to be effective in language learning. So that wasn't there. Now, my wife at the University of North Dakota had a totally different experience where they were basically doing Krashen's methodology and they had the entire semester to work it out and to put it into practice. Anyway, so I had an unfortunate and I would say generally unhelpful language learning experience in that course. Now, that said, I want to share with you another sound clip, and this time it's from a guy named Steve Kaufman. He is another language learning guru who speaks like 15 different languages, and here's something really important that he has to say. Hi there, Steve here, Steve Kaufman, again to talk about languages, as I always do here. And I have a confession to make. I was wrong and Stephen Krashen was right. I have often said that I consider the three keys to language learning success to be the attitude of the learner, the time we spend with the language, and the ability to notice. Now, it's not something that I came up with. This is something that I ha heard at a conference of the American Association of Teachers of Foreign Languages, and it was the head of the San Diego State University Language Department who said this, and I was very struck by it, and I have repeated it many times. Stephen Krashen would always say to me, noticing, no, we don't deliberately notice. We learn subconsciously through enough compelling, comprehensible, meaningful input. I have come to the conclusion that I was wrong and Stephen Krashen was right. And I think because I think that the ability to notice is something that develops naturally. It develops naturally if we get enough input, if we expose ourselves ourselves to the language, if we listen and if we read. So I will now say that the three keys to language learning success are, again, the attitude of the learner, you know, like the language, want to learn, want to be learning this language, confident that we can do it, all of these positive things that's extremely important. The second thing is the amount of time we spend with the language. 
In other words, not reading a grammar book in our own language, uh, not necessarily even sitting in a classroom. It's, it's the time we spend listening, reading, speaking, engaged with the language, that time. And the third thing is the availability of good, compelling, comprehensible, meaningful content. And in reflecting on my own language learning, I do best in those languages where I was able to find that content. And this means that we need initially to have beginner content, which again, I don't think should be absolute brain dead beginner content, but content much like our mini stories where you get into a sort of an intermediate level of content, but there is lots of repetition. And of course, because there's so much repetition, the stories can't be that tremendously compelling. But in the initial period, you're kind of motivated to, to get a sense of the language, to discover how the structure of that language, how it works and so forth. But very soon you have to get into something where you are actually interested in the content. Stephen Krashen uh, claims that this is stories, you know, fiction. He's a big believer in fiction. Personally, I'm more interested in nonfiction. And I've said before that in Chinese, the availability of graded readers on history and geography were very helpful in terms of getting me to the next stage where I could actually read and listen to content, you know, authentic documents from history or books and things of that nature. So finding that content is extremely important. And I think we should do more uh, language learners to pool our resources to help each other or, or even to create these resources uh, so that native speakers in a certain language, maybe there should be more people just recording conversations and maybe we could have a website where we all put them up there. So that now, for example, in Arabic, so that I could access natural conversations in Arabic transcribed or in Farsi. Uh, so, but I think this content thing is, it doesn't matter. Like I was at the Montreal Long Fest and there were different presentations and on different techniques, chunking, and there are some people who, who like to use Memrise and Anki. And of course, I don't very much. I just stay with Link. But all of that is secondary. Secondary. The key thing is the availability of meaningful content in the language. So that's the third one. Attitude then, time, and the content. Content is king. Uh, and I think that too much effort, that there's all kinds of starter books, grammar explanations, other dictionaries, Ankies, games, language learning games, none of that matters in my opinion. What matters is having suitable content. And, uh, and graded content, you know, can be a bridge to get to where you can access the authentic content. But I also think natural conversations are a bridge because typically in conversations, the vocabulary used is it's more sort of oriented towards high frequency words. So I would love to see an explosion of, 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 of um, conversations, you know, dialogues in different languages spoken naturally and then transcribed made available to language learners. Uh, you know, I had a comment, mm, I think it was here at YouTube. Uh, someone said, why would anyone learn Farsi? It's a difficult language and the, you know, the verbs show up in different places in the, uh, it, you know, uh, depending on whatever and stuff. Um, I don't know, he had a lot of criticism of Farsi. None of that matters. If I can find compelling and interesting content in Farsi, and I'm motivated because there's uh, Farsi speakers here in Vancouver, and because after all, Iran and Persia, in terms of there's 80, 90 million people there, uh, historically, it's been a very important uh, country, you know, 2,500 years ago, the Persian Empire was the largest uh, uh, you know, empire in the world and it's, all of that is kind of stimulating. So things that affect your motivation and the availability of good content is much more important than details of uh, that the language is too complicated and it's silly. And so every language has its complications. And I don't think Farsi is unique in that regard. It doesn't matter. The technique techniques you use don't really matter, except to the extent that you need to be efficient. So in consuming this compelling and interesting content, you should use techniques that are efficient, like thumbing through a dictionary, traditional dictionary is not efficient. No sooner do you close the dictionary than you've forgotten what you looked up. So I don't consider that efficient. 
but there are things that we can do to make this, you know, all important consuming of reading and listening more efficient because the more efficient it is, the greater intensity of the, the greater the intensity of the learning. But, but ultimately though, it's the interest level in that content, the ability to access it, the comprehensibility of it, that's going to make that input activity so powerful. So I just wanted to say that, and I think we have to try better at link as well. We have a lot of content there and people can import content. They can import eBooks, but I, we're going to be out there looking for partners who can provide us with whether it be free or even to sell across link, nothing wrong with paying for something. I would rather pay for content than pay for classroom time, quite frankly, because it's the content that's going to take us to fluency. So, just to summarize, I, I confess that I was wrong. And once again, Stephen Krashen was right. And he really is the guru when it comes to language learning. You can do other stuff. You can read the grammar. You can do flashcards. You can do all this other stuff. And that's good. And if you're motivated to do it, then do it. And it does provide you with, you know, a different form of exposure to the language and and does sort of maybe stimulate you if you're interested in those kinds of things. But overwhelmingly, overwhelmingly, it's your attitude, your the time you'll spend, and the availability of comprehensible, compelling input. And of course, all three are interrelated and reinforce each other. So I hope you're starting to see the weak link in this whole issue. And that's the fact that we just don't have comprehensible input resources for learners of Biblical Greek and Biblical Hebrew. It's just not there. And you know what? If this ever actually got some traction as a methodology, people might produce resources for this, but they would be too expensive for most people to use. So here's the actual situation right now in the world. You can find thousands of free resources to get comprehensible input in languages like English and Spanish and others. But you can find none in Biblical Hebrew or Greek for free. Of course, the exception to that is the stuff that my wife and I are producing. But basically, there's a premium on anything to learn Biblical languages, and then you can sign up. There's things called like Link and others, other sites where you can get all of this quality content and an app and all this other stuff for free. I would like to suggest that it should be the opposite, that we as Christians should be showing to the world that we can be more radically generous and that we consider the biblical languages more important than learning English or Spanish, and that we are more passionately interested in helping people be able to read the Bible in the original language than other people are passionate and interested in helping people be able to read English. It's not at all that it's impossible to make quality, rich, compelling content available in the original languages for free. It's not at all the case. It is possible. There are people who can do it, but then those people aren't doing it because maybe they don't believe in the methodology. And then number two, if they are doing it, they are definitely just doing it as a source of income. So the secular world has proven to us that number one, this is possible, it works, and we can give it away for free. They've shown us this, and so I think it would be really sad, really, really sad, if we said, no, we're going to let you guys give away stuff for free to help people learn English and Spanish and whatever else, but we're going to just stick with our stuff, and we're going to still charge, you know, 40, 50 bucks for each resource that somebody wants in the biblical languages. Anyway, that's enough preaching from me. But I hope you hear my heart in this, and it's a heart full of love for those who have sacrificially given their lives to teach the biblical languages to people, whether or not it's in the methodology that is most effective. But that doesn't mean that we can't challenge each other and encourage one another to do better and to think clearly about the implications of what we're doing for the future. 
So my plea to those who teach with the traditional methodology, champion and encourage and be cheerleaders for those who want to break out of the mold. Do everything you can to facilitate that kind of teaching and its growth and its proliferation around the world. Do everything you can to encourage people to experience that kind of teaching and then create free open access resources, compelling, rich, comprehensible input content that people all over the world can use. I cannot be the only voice encouraging people to do that. We need everyone doing their part, encouraging and inspiring people to embrace innovation for the glory of God and our joy. 